Hello, and welcome to Coding Cave. My name is Andre. And my name is Chris. And today, we'll be sharing an interview we did with Jose Valim, the creator of Elixir, in collaboration with Context Free. If you haven't seen the first part of this interview, pause this video, stop what you're doing, do not pass go, do not collect your stimulus check, and check it out on his channel. Otherwise, let's get started. So what can we, you were talking about the just in time, what, what are you expecting from that? Oh, uh, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not really expecting anything. Uh, you know, it, it came, I know like the, the OTP team, uh, they have been exploring like JIT for a while. And it seems like this time they landed on a solution that they are really happy with. And uh, so they announced it. Hey, we we it came out of nowhere in a way. They said, like, hey, you know, we 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 have a JIT that works. Uh, we worked on it for like seven months, I think, because it started in January. They announced in September, so eight nine months. And you know, we are really happy with this. Like the trade off seems to be good. And they just announced it. And since and like, I this is no exaggeration. Like on the day they announced it, I got the branch. And I have been running the branch since then, or a more recent version. And I have never found any bug, which to me is amazing. And everything is like, everything is like, it's measurable faster. It's like, you you can see it's not measurable because you could measure a 5% difference. It's better. It's like, it's noticeable faster, right? You're like, wait, my, my code is compiling faster. My tests are running faster. So to me, that, that, that's just amazing. And, um, and you know, it's, um, <laughs> and, and then, and then and they say it's like, there's a lot of, uh, they say that there's a lot of road for improvement as well. So I don't have any expectations, but I am like, I'm super happy with, with what we got so far. And uh, we'll see, you know, whatever come, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm already really, really happy whatever comes after this is a plus. And I have a, one of my coworkers, Wojtek, he got the new Mac, uh, which a lot of people report. It's like, it's uh, super, super fast. So it's funny because, not funny, uh, maybe it is, <laughs> but he, like the time for him to compile Elixir on his new Mac, which I think is like a, the MacBook Air, which is not even the most powerful thing. With my Mac, which is the previous MacBook without the new cores, it's the same time, but I'm using the JIT and he's not using the JIT. So, you know, like maybe in, maybe in like uh, when we get the JIT to, to work, uh, whenever they get the JIT to work on the new Macs, we, we, I will probably, and I'm finally able to afford one of the new Macs or I'm happy with them. I'm probably going to see another like, you know, 30% speed jump or something like that, which to me is just, is just amazing. Like, you know, if you can make me more productive uh, and make things run faster, I'll take it anytime. Uh, that's that's why I started this because I wanted to use all the cores in your machine, right? So, uh, so yeah, um, bring bring it on. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. I've been thinking about getting a new Mac myself. The the Lumen project is an effort to create a head of time compiler for Beam languages to native executables and WebAssembly. Uh, what do you think of such efforts? I think I think it's uh, it's a great thing to 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 explore. Uh, it's it's a really big project, so uh, really kudos to Dockyard for for tackling this. And and you know I think I think it's important. And and I think all the, like generally there is always good things like coming back from those efforts uh, because you know you you learn more about things, you learn more about different techniques. Like so you know like. When, when it's working and running it natively, you can look at the code and say, hey, you know, this is running natively much faster because they're using the LVM to chain. And then when you're going to look at the code that it is emitted, it's like, oh, the LV LVM to chain was able to make these and that optimizations. Maybe we should port those to the beam and, you know, and, and vice versa. So I think those efforts are, are very important. And, um, and, you know, it can also bring things like running Elixir natively on the web browser, which can be interesting as well. So uh, yeah, I am all in for it. And from history, we do have um, a lot of experiences from, um, from this kind of work. So just to give an example, 
before the JIT, we had something which was called the Hype Compiler, which was the high performance Erlang compiler that would compile Erlang to native. It would be AOT compilation, not just in time compilation. Uh, and, you know, and when they added the JIT, the, this hype compiler, it was retired. But when you look at the history, at the process of them, like building this hype compiler to compile to native, they brought a lot of improvements to the Erlang compiler to chain. So there is a blog post that they, they wrote telling about the history of hype uh, on the Erlang blog. The, the Erlang team has a blog that is very interesting that outlines all those improvements that came exactly, you know, from this exploration of like branching out and trying to compile things differently and how we can learn from this. So yeah, I think this is great. Awesome. And in terms of other interesting things Elixir has been doing recently, uh, we've seen it branching out into new domains like nerves for internet of things and embedded or NX that you've just announced for numerical computing and machine learning. What makes Elixir a good fit for these domains? So I, all of them, I think like they have, they are like, they are some, it's for different reasons. So for example, for web, like uh, let's start with web, which is the most known one, but I think it's the easiest to explain. Like the Erlang VM was built for te telecommunication. It was built to run on top of a socket and guess what is running on top of sockets, right? Web applications, distributed systems, all this kind of stuff. So I think that's a natural good fit and it's very easy to, to, to argue for that. Uh, in my presentations I did in the beginning about Elixir, I had a, a slide where I would show like how a, a, a te telecommunication network would, would look like with like some telephone switches, some endpoints and some clients. And then in the next slide, I would just swap the labels to be like web servers, APIs, browsers, Right, and it's just, it's very visible to see like, hey, you know, if it was good for that, it's probably going to be good for this shoe. And I think that's kind of how a lot of the resurgence of Erlang back in like 2006, 2007 uh, came to be because it's a very easy mapping to make. Uh, and then with things like nerves, I was not uh, involved in that at all, but when I heard the story, it made a lot of sense because I like, hey, you know, we're working with, uh, people work with embedded systems, right? They knew like they had experience where, you know, like, hey, if something, if something goes wrong, like you break the device, right? Or somebody needs to hold a button for five seconds and then insert the colony code so the thing comes back to life. And then, and then they found this platform like the, the early virtual machine where you could have your code written in supervisors and it was really thought about fault tolerance and robustness by default and they're like hey no this would be great like what if you know instead of if i get a if my wi-fi fails instead of it like breaking the device or having to reset it i just have a supervisor inside the code that is going to restart the driver for me and i don't have to do anything else um so that was the insight they had at the time and why they chose the platform. And, um, and I, th I, may be, I may be wrong, but I think it was originally Erlang, but because Elixir had a stronger focus on the tooling and making the tooling extensible, they eventually migrated to Elixir because of the tooling. So, you know, it's a different, it's a, it's a very different aspect that they are exploring where you know web is about like sockets and having high level abstractions where here they're focused on the tooling which is very important for embedded and so on uh, and then for things like and then there are other things like uh, data processing and uh, data streaming which i always again is i think it's a variation of the socket problem you're moving data back and forth all the time so you know being able to manage multiple sockets being able to ingest data concurrently and talk with a bunch of different things. They are all good features. And so those were one of the things that I started focus on as soon as Elixir 1.0 came out because I knew it, it was most likely going to be a good fit. So it makes sense to explore. And then there are other things like multimedia, out and video processing, um, which again, it's kind of around the same lines. You need a lot of native integration. So this is a more recent development just to give a, some, a little bit of background here. Quite some time, ago, for some time, uh, the Erlang virtual machine did not have, it, it, had, it had different mechanisms to run, to integrate with native code, like things written in C. So you could, you could start an operating system process, which is 
great for isolation, but it comes with its own pitfalls, but you can do that. So for example, nerves actually prefer this method because robustness, it's really important for them. So they start separating operating processes to manage the drivers and so on. Uh, and they communicate with Erlang full ports. You can start a separate node, uh, works great in some cases, but depending on the problems on what you want, or you can integrate the code natively into the VM, right? With the downside that if that C code has a segmentation fault, everything goes bad. And you can see why the nervous people that, so it's like, it's going to break our device, for example, right? Like, are you, you need to do a hard reset. That's why the nervous people, they're not, they try to avoid that as much as possible. Um, and for the native integration for a good period of time, you could only do, you could do only very quick work inside of it. It's like, you cannot, you cannot uh, do work that takes like more than five milliseconds. Uh, and the reason for that is because the way Erlang is preemptive, the code is preemptive. So if you have like eight cores, you have like eight, eight operating system threads to run all of your Elixir and Erlang processes. And um, this, when you would call the native code, it would run inside this thread, those threads. So if you took too long, because you're running in C, the Erlang virtual machine could not preempt other software and that could lead to weird behavior. So in a way it's like the options for doing like this kind, you know, the integrations, they were limited. And if you're thinking for doing like video streaming, for example, multimedia video streaming, like, Sure, you could you send the data to a separate process? You could, but we're talking about a lot of data, right? So if you can, if you can do that, so maybe our so for issues like this, you know, if you're doing like a high per, high performance video streaming, coding, decoding something, you say, you know what, it's fine if if there's a segmentation fault and things. Hopefully there isn't, but you know, if there's a segmentation fault and something goes wrong, or you can also use other options like I'm going to use Rust, so you are not having segmentation faults, but I, but in other words, I'm going to say it's fine for me to integrate with native things, right? And to run that inside a virtual machine. So I think in, when Erlang 19 came out, uh, that was like five or six years ago, uh, they added, they made official the option that we call dirty NIF. So NIF is native integrated function is how we call native code, can be C, Rust, C++, right? And they made dirty NIFs. And dirty NIFs, you say, hey, this is going to, use a lot of CPU or this is going to use IO and then they can move those things to specific threads that are doing extra CPU work or doing extra IO work. And when they did that, it opened up the possibility for us to have like Membrane, which is a framework for like multimedia, audio and video streaming. And they also have a, they also have a, a framework for Erlang as well that is really known and used. I think it's early, early video or something like that. But anyway, so, you know, it, it allowed like this kind of application as well. And it also allowed um, what I have been recently working on, which is NX, which stands for numerical elixir. Because the thing about numerical, like numerical computations, so numerical elixir brings, brings like tensors, so you can work with like multidimensional arrays. Uh, and it also brings a feature which allows you to compile a subset of elixir to, to the GPU. And the thing about running data on the GPU is that most times, what a lot, of, not most times, a lot of times what is expensive is a data copy, is moving the data to the GPU. So you can clearly see that, you know, like that running the data, you can clearly see that uh, running on a separate process is not going to fly, right? Because you have to move the data now to a separate process and that process is going to move to the GPU, that's not going to be performant. So, um, so yeah, so for numerical elixir, for example, I think it's a combination of different factors. So. Uh, one is now this ability that we have to integrate ni nicely with native code and say if that code is going to be IO bound or CPU bound. That was a really important development. Uh, for NX, uh, the fact that we can compile a subset of the language to the GPU is really made possible by Elixir macros and the abstractions that we've created to build the language that play not important role. And the other thing is I actually think that functional programming is a really good fit uh, for, um, for this numerical computing stuff, which in, which in a way it sounds like very counterintuitive because functional programming we are working with immutable data, right? So if I have, you know, you can think, and, and we, we express this data with byte arrays, right? So if you say like, hey, you know, I want to, 
I want to multiply every element on this one million per, per one million matrix per two. It's going to make a copy of that matrix. But you know, if you have a really large matrix and you do an operation on it, you're going to copy the whole matrix. And they would say, well, so functional programming is clearly not a good fit. But the thing is that, and we even see this happening in Python, a lot of, uh, the, the, a lot of the, the abstractions, they are moving to, to be more higher level where actually what, so this is what uh, JAX, the JAX package in Python, it does, is that when you write your code, you're not actually doing the operations directly. It's actually building a graph with everything you want to do, all the computations that you want to do on the GPU. So when you execute the, the Elixir code or the JAX code in the sense, there is no computation happening. It's building this graph of computations. And it happens that when you're building this graph of computations, you want to treat everything as immutable because you want to propagate everything for the graph. And so, you know, so, and you want to think about things in a functional approach as well, because that gives a higher level abstraction for you to map particular operations to the GPU, particular operations to the CPU. You want to stay at a high level domain. And then functional programming is really good to do that. So I think it ended up being become, uh, it ended up being one of our strengths as well that is allowing us to explore things like NX, which is, uh, it's very exciting to me. Yeah, I agree, it's very exciting. And actually when I saw you referencing Jax in your presentations, I'm like, oh, that's, that's a good sign here. <laughs> so, and it made a lot of sense to me. Um, anyway, uh, talking about the language, you, uh, in the Elixir 1.9 release notes, it says a language itself is complete. Does NX's def n count as a language change and or are there possibly other language changes in the future? Yeah, so um, yeah, so when we say that Elixir is, is complete, uh, I just want to clarify that because sometimes it throws people off, is, is more like we have an empty backlog, more like a thing. Like, so, you know, we, we've released two new versions after uh, 1.9 and they have a, a bunch of exciting improvements, but we don't have like any really large plan features. It's just like, hey, you know, we made this faster, or we added this small convenience here, we add small additions to the API. So for example, I know the next Elixir version, 1.12, um, we can even talk about it very quickly, hold on just a second. But I know like the next Elixir, Elixir version has like five new functions in the in num module, uh, which is what we use to work with collections. Like we have now zip with, uh, and we have count until like small additions, small changes, you know? So it's more like to say kind of the focus, like we're not planning to kind of go and revolutionize the language and change everything, right? Our focus is uh, continue with more improvements on things that, um, that we find, continue improving the error messages, continue improving the, the errors that we, we can find um, at compilation time, this kind of stuff. Uh, so, so, so now going back to, so that's kind of what we mean. So we have been continuously improving the language here and there, uh, adding a quality of life, really improvements. And, uh, but the cool thing about NX is that I didn't have to do any change to Elixir for that to work. Uh, it's all built on the principles, uh, on the principles that I said, like, you know, everything, Oh, the, thing, the things that we use to build the language, they are there for developers to use and extend the language. So it's built on those principles and those ideas. There, there is nothing really, there is nothing, nothing really new. I think for that with time, we are going to, we are going to see, we are going to see like small requests to improve things here and there. So just to give you an example, okay. Uh, in Elixir, we don't have a power operator which most other languages they have, I think, like Python has it, Ruby has it. And, you know, like it, it makes sense. Like nobody was really using, you know, Elixir for that is going to say, hey, I, I'm really using the power operator in anger, right? To say, hey, I really need that. Um, so I can see, for example, like um, us adding a power operator because, you know, people are going to start to use Elixir more and more for like numerical computing and stuff. And they can say, well, this is a reasonable addition. It actually makes sense, right? Uh, we just didn't need it before, but it makes sense now. Um, and then I can see other things. So Elixir, we have uh, custom operators, but the way we design custom operators for Elixir is that it's not like, so some languages they're like, hey, if you 
have anything starting with this. It defines a set of rules. So you can have like any amount of crazy operators that you want, as long as you abide to certain rules. And I always found that a little bit too critical. So our so we have custom operators, but our operators are not really custom. Like it's rather we have um, maybe eight or ten operators that they are not actually used by Elixir. They are there. The parser understands, but Elixir by itself doesn't use them. Or maybe just a subset of Elixir use them. Like you know, if we import the bitwise module, you get bitwise operators. They're not imported by default. So it's like those operators, they're there like for people to use. So one of the discussions that we had uh, already because of an X, like, hey, I think we really need a matrix multiplication operator. Uh, and our policy has always been, you know, like we can add new operators as long as people provide new use cases for them. And we have added, I think, not even too far a goal to this and a goal. So, you know, we may do like small additions, but things like adding a new operator is like 10 lines of code change. You change the operator table, you change the tokenizer, the tokenizer, you update the documentation and that's it, right? You ship it. So I can see some, some, of, uh, uh, some changes uh, coming because of this, uh, but I think they're all like super, super small. None is going to require us to like kind of um, revolutionize and, 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 and flip everything or radically change the, the way you write Elixir code. That makes sense. Now I've talked quite a bit about language design uh, by now. Is there one extra tip you might give to somebody who's making their own language that we haven't talked about? Oh, um, I think I think I touched the most important points to me, I, which were like getting out there and talk uh, to people, and you know, get 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 some attention to the language, and uh, and work on the onboarding experience. Extremely important, you know. Um, I think everybody today is used to really good tooling, so it cannot be an afterthought, right? You need to you need to think on the tooling and make and making the things that people are going to be doing all the time, like compiling code, running code, running tasks. Uh, and you need to focus on that and make that a, a first class citizen. Thanks. What are you most excited for about the future in Elixir? Oh, uh, that's, so that's a tough question because I have always tried to, to, to keep like, I don't know if, I'm going to use the word correctly. I'm trying to be like very agnostic and not really put myself into that, like try to be fairly neutral um, because, you know, like, um, so like we talked about things like nerves, right? And, you know, if it depended on me, I would never have come up with that idea. And I think it's great. I think nerves really showed the way of how Elixir can be a language that works across multiple domains and brought uh, like uh, diversity to the community. So I try to be like fairly neutral uh, to those things. I don't try to think too much about it. Okay. And do you have any other closing remarks? Um, no, I don't think so. I hope whoever is listening to this is excited to give um, Elixir a try and explore one of the the many domains that we have a good foundation and a good ecosystem for. And I hope everyone's going to have a good time.